Good afternoon. I have an honor. It's, I count it an honor to be able to speak before everyone this, this afternoon. Uh, since we've been going through the book of Judges on our Wednesday evening services, I couldn't help but notice all the awful things that the nation of Israel was going through, specifically all of the deception and dishonesty. So today, if you haven't guessed, I've chosen to talk on the subject of deception. As Christians, we are in a world that is shrouded in deceptions. People around us lie or manipulate in order to deceive those around them to get what they want. However, we are supposed to stand apart from the world and shine the truth, whether it be the word of God or living an honest example for those around us to see. This afternoon, we will look at two examples of deception from God's word. There are so many quotes out there about deception, but the best quotes are from the scripture, of course. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. First, we will look at the relationship between Samson and Delilah, for our example of manipulation. Secondly, we will look at the lie that Ananias and Sapphira told and where that got them. And to conclude this study, we will end up with the strength that we harness by living honestly. Now, for the first type of deception, manipulation, let's look at the example of Samson and Delilah. For the sake of knowing what's going on, please follow along, and I'll read Judges 16, that's Judges chapter 16, verse 4 through 20. Now, this is a pretty lengthy reading, so bear with me. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him, find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your strength, where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying in her room, in her, staying with her in her room, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not yet known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson, and men are lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Now, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head into a web of loom, so she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the baton and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you, where your, where your heart is not with me, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me. And I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he 
had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come upon, or come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money to her hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. I could not resist using this example of manipulation for my topic of de deception. Delilah here is a master deceiver. Despite how direct she is trying to obtain Samson's weakness, her motives still evade Samson's attention. As God's children, we should avoid being in situations that lead to sin. She is the perfect example of what we are not to be as Christians. A verse that well describes Delilah is Proverbs 22, verse 14. That's Proverbs 22, 14. It says, The mouth of an immoral woman is a deep pit. He who, abhorred, he who is abhorred by the Lord will fall there. She ultimately manipulated Samson and likely herself to their own destruction. Anyone who follows this path will do the same. To lie is sin. And Samson lied to Delilah. As bad as that was, to deceive our Heavenly Father is an even more grave mistake. For our second way of deception, let's look at the example of Ananias and Sapphira and how they are a good example of how we should never lie to our Heavenly Father. So for our last not as lengthy reading, we'll read um, the, this account in uh, the book of Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. That's Acts 5, 1, 1 through 11. <clears throat> it reads, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, came in, found her dead, and carried her out and buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. This is, this example is a very, very sad tragedy of being dishonest. I chose this example because I thought it was the most impactful example of the consequences of lying. It's easy to see by cause and effect specifically how the Lord feels about uh, lying, about dishonesty, specifically towards himself. To lie is to be the antithesis of all of what the Lord stands for. Lying is only good, never. As Christians, part of our commissions is to uphold the truth, no matter what. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, that's 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, 
and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. It's bad enough to be lied to. Let's bear the truth in righteousness. Lastly, deception is one of Satan's master crafted weapons, not to be underestimated. What I mean by that is, as we know, we will be tempted to deceive others in order to get the better temporary outcome. Our Heavenly Father does not condone this behavior, and he makes this ever clear at the end of Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. It reads, But there shall be by no means enter it anything that defi defiles or causes abomination or lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It doesn't have to be this way, though. But we must be honest people. To live a life of honesty means first and foremost that we are in good favor with God. The rewards for living truthful lives far outweigh the possibility of gaining a temporary uh, footing in this life by means of deception. Thankfully, we still live in a world where some do value honesty over lies. All the more reason as Christians to show that example. Thomas Jefferson said, Honesty is the first chapter in the Book of Wisdom. And then Benjamin Franklin said, Honesty is the best policy. There are many quotes from people of the world. If people of the world hold this standard, then we, as children of God, must hold the standard of truth. Thank you for your attention this afternoon. Hopefully everyone has been benefited from this study. This has been an especially good study for myself because I have battled with dishonesty in my own life at times, and I would definitely recommend the truth in all walks of life, no matter what. To end, let's read one last quote, the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6. It's John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank Trace for a great lesson. Dishonesty is a very big problem because sometimes it can seem so easy to get away with it. But yeah. So I'd like to once again express my thanks for the opportunity to speak. I hope that what I have to say will be found edifying rather than vain and worthless, because this is a type of vain and worthless speech that I want to discuss this afternoon, specifically saying God's name in vain. Clicker is not. We all know how much of an everyday thing it is to hear people uh, swear on the name of God and to use his name as a profanity. So I don't think I really need to explain how prevalent of an issue it is. But I find this to be a very interesting issue because it's prevalent despite being so uh, undisputably and provably wrong. Exodus 20 verse 7 reads, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And we also have other verses which echo these same sentiments. Many people who profess a Christian faith already know about these verses and have a vague uh, understanding that to say God's name in vain is wrong, yet do so regardless. I believe that similar to drug addicts, these poor souls have fallen victim to peer pressure, have become victims of uh, desensitization by normalization, and just gotten to a habit of not thinking about their harmful actions. I truly think that if we can turn their vague understanding into a fuller conceptualization, and to do so lovingly with soft and wise words, that we can inspire most of these individuals to change their ways. I want us to give us an understanding and conceptualization that goes beyond the obvious, uh, it's disrespectful. A fuller conceptualization comes from understanding, one, the importance of our speech, two, the symbolic significance of God's name, and three, how saying God's name in vain damages our concept of God. I'll do my best to explain these three concepts so each of us can more effectively convince those poor souls. 
starting with the importance of our speech. The importance of our speech is a concept that I feel many people who say the Lord's name in vain uh, don't fully understand. We all what we all have to understand is that our speech reflects our true nature. Jesus spoke quite a bit about the importance of our speech in the time of his ministry. I'd like to read Matthew 15, verse 8 to 19, which read, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, nay, the nay defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemy. The words that come out of our, ha our mouths are the tangible manifestations of our thoughts. They are windows into our hearts, as you've probably heard it put. I'd also like, I'd also like to read Luke 6, uh, verses 43 through 49, which read, uh, or 45, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. A common defense I've heard people who say God's name in vain uh, use is that they don't intend for what they say to be disrespectful or that they don't really mean what they say. In fact, they might not even realize how much they say it. But that defense flies in the face of these teachings. Saying God's name in vain is evidence of a disrespectful mindset regarding God. We cannot say that our hearts are right with God, but then openly blaspheme his name, because those blasphemies come from our hearts, the core of our intents and thoughts. One might say, what? No, I don't have any evil or disrespect in my heart towards God. You know, I slip up pretty often, but I still love God with all of my heart. Now what I would say to this is, yes, yes, we all slip up often, but if we love God, then we will do our best to recognize our slip ups and fix them. If we know that what we're doing is against God, but just accept it and don't try to change, then we're only deluding ourselves when we say that we love God. Then I'll point to 1 John 2, verses three through five, which read, now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. And 1 John 4, verse 20, which reads, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God, God whom he has not seen? To say that we love an all-knowing being, but then to do what he says not to do is inherently contradictory, and we are only deceiving ourselves if that is the case. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. It's also worth noting the extremely explicit forbiddance by Jesus of swearing uh, to God, and by swearing I mean things like I swear to God or on God or honest to God. As swearing on God's name is a very common uh, way of, that people say his name in vain. Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37 read, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Christ talked about these ideas on more than one occasion. We have recorded a dialogue between him and some hypocritical religious leaders of the time, where he restates, he restates these same ideas, but then also links our speech to judgment. That dialogue can be found in Matthew 12, verses 33 through 30, uh, 37, which read, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. We also see these exact sentiments echoed after Jesus' death by James. James 3, verses 6 through 12 read, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Uh, the concept, the importance of our speech, is something the scriptures nail on again and again and again. We can't just brush off saying uh, God's name in vain as if it doesn't matter, because it does matter. All that we say matters because what we say reflects our hearts. If it didn't matter, why would an all-knowing being see it fit to uh, have that concept restated again and again and again? We should speak of God's name in ways that honor him, ways that reflect hearts that respect him, because his name uh, has symbolic significance that deserves respect. All right. So God is a bit of a poet. He uses he can he conveys very complex ideas and enigmatic narratives through symbolism and hidden meanings. One of those poetic devices he uses are names. There are many instances of name changes in the Bible. Uh, and you may find those instances strange, but those names are used to express ideas in a poetic way. One such example is with Sarai. God changed her name from Sarai, which means my princess, to Sarah, which means mother of nations. This was because from her descendants would come the physical nations of the Jewish people, and from the Jewish people would eventually come Jesus Christ, who brought about the spiritual nation of the kingdom of God. I say all this to say that God's name itself has symbolic significance. We are to respect his name because it symbolizes God's attributes in totality. Psalm 29, 2, verse A reads, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Due to his name, because his name is God. In everything that that name entails, the creator, the cosmos, the almighty, the Lord. The scriptures exalt God's name in the highest possible terms, and we should as well. Psalm 8, 1, verse A reads, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. All of this is part of why Jesus began the Lord's Prayer as he did in Matthew 6, verse 9, which reads, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And hallowed is just a word that means uh, sanctified or highly respected. So Jesus is praying that God's uh, name be sanctified or highly respected. We should speak of God in a way that reflects the symbolic significance of his name. Whenever someone says God's name in a vain way that does not properly reflect its significance, they, as well as many of those around them, have their concept of the significance of God lessened, or just straight up empty. Which brings me to my final point. how saying God's name in vain damages our concept of God. Now this is a difficult point to articulate, but I want to try and articulate it nonetheless. When God's name is said in vain, there's more of a problem with it than it's simply being a disrespectful statement. The other problem 
comes from how that attitude of disrespect has a way of uh, spreading and feeding itself whenever it is expressed by saying God's name in vain. Words are thoughts given tangible form, and because of that, they have great influence. When we say words, in a sense, we take the thoughts they represent, their meanings, and what they symbolize into our hearts. So if we say words that stem from evil thoughts, those evil thoughts have a way of worming themselves into our thought processes. This is a significant part of the importance of our speech. It's not just about how speech reflects the heart, but about how speech changes the heart. Second Timothy 2 verses 16 to uh, 17a read, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. I want to put special emphasis on this last verse, and their message will spread like cancer. The message of disrespect in saying God's name in vain multiplies like a cancer cell in the hearts of those who speak it. But it doesn't just spread to the host, it spreads to those around them like a sneeze from an ill person. Humans are easily influenced creatures. The environments we are in and the people we surround ourselves with shape our thought processes. When we are in an environment where we are surrounded by disrespectful use of God's name, those disrespectful messages worm their way into our thought processes, like germs from a sneeze to the face, worm their way into our bodies. And I can say that it's wormed its way into my thought processes. I hate to say it, but there's this subconscious part of me that causes me to recoil at any mention of God, despite the efforts of my conscious mind. And it's because of how the world has abused God's name. His name is constantly used in the most unnecessary, why would you even think to use in that context type of ways. And to hear the name of the God hanged upon a cross for us, who had his back scourged, bleeding, where he could most likely see the muscles torn open. And to see someone use God's name in vain with obviously no recognition of the weight of that can really feel like an unapologetic sneeze to the face. But I still think these poor souls can be inspired to change their ways if we, with soft and wise words, can help them to understand. Help them to understand the importance of our speech. That our speech reflects our hearts. That if, to say we love God, but then to say his name in vain is contradictory and that we will be judged by our speech, to understand the symbolic significance of God's name, that God is God in everything that name entails, and that we aren't to treat his name with such unimportance and disrespect. Then finally, to understand how saying God's name in vain damages our concept of God, how the use of God's name without its proper symbolic significance changes the heart to make that name seem not so significant at all. And how that message spreads like an awful disease. I'd like to end up with a verse. Exodus 20, verse 7 reads, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Will we fill our words with vain sayings of the name of God that empty his name of its significance? and therefore make him empty in our hearts, then have God returned to us in kind by refusing to empty us of our guilt? Or will we fill our words with the weight of God's name and his truth, thereby filling our hearts with affections for his name, then have God returned to us in kind by giving us a new name in heaven? Now with that said, thank you. And on to the next brother. Well, as always, I'd like to thank the congregation for the blessing and opportunity to speak. Uh, and I'm extremely thankful for the two lessons we've just heard. Uh, so for my lesson, it's more of a reminder. I, I took the approach as I was thinking about this of uh, how I wanted to grow as a Christian. And, and hopefully you guys can uh, take something away from that. <clears throat> so starting out, 
uh, this lesson may be a little different compared to the ones I've given in the past. So during this weekend, I was going about my day and mulling over lesson ideas. I did something that I often find myself doing. I ended up getting distracted and thinking about other things at the same time, as one does. This is where the idea for the lesson came. And at the time, I was thinking about what spiritually minded goals I should be setting in the next week and how I should be growing as a Christian. So I thought, well, hey, you could write a whole lesson on goals we should have as Christians and how we need to actively grow. So today, I'm going to give you four quick points on goals that I came up with. And hopefully, it can benefit you or somehow be an encouragement to you as the next, next week progresses. So the title I went with is Conscious Sustained Growth. Point number one, the Christian and their influence. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, it reads, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So I want to start off with a question. How cognizant are you of your influence on those in your daily life? Would you say that your attitude and actions affect people in a positive way? These are questions I find myself asking as I reflect on the daily work I do throughout the week. Far too often, I come up with the answer that, no, I haven't been doing enough to positively influence others and point them towards God. And many times I find myself zoning out, wishing for the clock to tick by fast, faster so I can get to the next part of my day. <clears throat> As Christians, we need to be cognizant of how we are making use of the time that God has given us. Make any effort this week to involve those around you in a positive way. It could be something like seeing an opportunity to talk about God or Scripture, or going out of your way to help someone when they aren't expecting it. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, it reads, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This leads pretty well into my next point which is the Christian and his duty to encourage. So how often do you offer an encouraging word to a brother or sister in Christ? How keen are your senses in regard to noticing when a fellow Christian might benefit from a kind or uplifting word? In my case, it's similar to what I said in my last point. Going to and from church twice a week, it's easy to get in the tunnel vision and get lost in the routine of life. And I'm grateful to God to be part of such an amazing congregation in this regard. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for all the encouragement you give. And let's be eager and willing to build each other up as much as possible when we come together to worship in the Lord. Paul had this to say in his letter to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. But let's not forget the impact that an encouraging word can have on those that are out in the world. I feel spoiled in a sense growing up in the church. For my whole life, I have been surrounded by loving people who wanted nothing for the but the absolute best for me. And it has taken me some time to understand how dark the world can be for some. I say this because we really don't understand just how in one encouraging word could help someone out there. <clears throat> Dealing with the absolute terrible circumstances of life. It's been really saddening for me just to see how starved some people are for a genuine word of encouragement. The times are wicked, but as Christians, this means we have even more power than ever to affect positive change in people's lives. So let's strive for that, to strive to be that for the people in the world that need us. And I'll continue in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, with verses 14 and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for both yourselves and for all. Point number three, the Christian in prayer. What is your prayer life like? What does prayer mean to you? Is it something that you do out of habit, without much thought put into it? Or is it done with an honest and grateful heart? What do you pray for? Do you find yourself praying for mostly things that you want out of life? Or do you pray for the good of others? One way of offering an effective prayer can be broken down into two parts. That is gratitude and, for lack of a better word, thoughtfulness. So what is gratitude? Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. To be grateful is to appreciate 
and recognize that all of the good things and blessings in life come from God. In our prayers this week, this week let us reflect on the many blessings we have and give God the credit that is due Him. A lot of problems and struggles in this life can have their pain reduced with a grateful perspective to prayer. This brings me to the thoughtfulness that is found in prayer. Take a moment sometime this week before you pray to truly appreciate what it is we do when we bow our heads. We are given the opportunity to approach the God of the universe and speak to Him directly through His Son, Jesus Christ. It goes back to what Cole said about God, the, uh, the meaning behind His name. When you really comprehend that, it's something that is truly special. This mere fact is beyond our comprehension in what this truly means. And this is all the more reason as to why we need to choose our words carefully when we pray to God. Let's see what the Lord Jesus himself taught about prayer when he was teaching the disciples in Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. It is also important that we make praying for others a priority in our prayers. Using Jesus as our model, we can see that he prayed for other people all the time while he was on this earth. One of the greatest and most obvious examples of this is when Jesus prayed for his disciples, and then later he prayed for all those who would come to believe in him. That's in John chapter 17. Let's read an excerpt of that prayer. In John chapter 17, verses 15 through 17. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. We would do well to always be thoughtful of others when we pray. The power of prayer is something we can all, too, take for granted constantly. God hears us when we earnestly pray for others and their conditions. I can't even begin to imagine how much the prayers of my family and my church family have saved me and helped me many times over in my life. Point number four, the Christian and study. How do you study the Bible throughout the week? Do you have a daily schedule? This for me has been one of my greatest struggles. Recently, I've had so many hobbies and obligations that it's hard for me to make Bible study the priority it needs to be sometimes. So this week, I plan on reading through and studying the book of Amos. Picking out a book or a set of chapters to read and reflect on throughout each week is a good start to the steady growth of your knowledge of Scripture. There are many ways we can study, and you should find the one or endeavor to find the one that works best for you. Perhaps getting together with some members of the congregation or finding, or finding a Bible study course could facilitate an easier learning experience. There are many different methods, but in the end what truly matters is that we dedicate the time out of our week to studying the Holy Book. So I know this lesson was kind of brief, but these are my thoughts this afternoon. I plan to carry them with me throughout this week, and I think it's a very good thing to take an active role in your development as a Christian. Ask yourself what you can do better this week, and make a plan to put it into action.